Fabulous. Well, bird or bab, good morning all. It's uh, good to see a lot of you on, on the screen uh, from, from here and abroad. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to know that others will be joining us later on YouTube. So whenever you're, you're joining this, this time of worship together, uh, it's good to, to have you with us. And we know that every week as we gather at our church services, we always bring uh, very different feelings and perspectives. Every single week that we gather, that there's people in our congregation who are celebrating good news and others who are mourning. Some who come way down with anxieties and aches, others who come full of beans. There are some who have a strong faith, others who are struggling to believe. And this week, perhaps for some, it's been especially so because it has been a strange few days. Uh, been a lot more change, more loss, more upheaval. And I know that today we come with very different views about the monarchy, about royal family and the queen. Uh, some I know for a fact who are here on the Zoom at least have been quite saddened, really quite saddened by the queen's death. Whilst others I also know are a little bit more upset about who is now being called the Prince of Wales. So some of us are royalists, some Republicans, some really not that bothered either way. But whatever our views, um, a child of God has died and a family are grieving. And so we acknowledge that. Uh, and I was at St. Catherine's on Friday and I, I was invited to write in their book of condolence. And they've certainly been, they certainly would welcome anyone from uh, the town to, to write in their book of condolence that they're using. And I will be talking with both sets of elders, got two elders meetings this week, uh, to talk about whether and how we mark the Queen's passing, whether we have a separate uh, service of worship for those who want to come and spend time in prayer doing that. Uh, for now, though, the rest of this service will go pretty much ahead as, as usual after a, a short prayer. Some might think that's disrespectful to, to have a, a normal service, but I would say that the Queen, uh, more than most people, knew what it was to carry on in times of change. But for now, uh, before we get going properly, uh, let's pray. Living God, our rock and our redeemer. As we come to worship you this morning, we give you thanks for the life of Elizabeth Windsor, for a long life and her service to Commonwealth and nations. And some of us treasure memories of meeting her or of celebrating and marking moments in her life, of her presence at significant times in our history or, or speaking to us via radio and TV. So we thank you for the example of faith and grace that she shared with many. And we pray for those who will miss her most deeply, that they will find comfort and hope. Today, again, we can celebrate and affirm our faith that death is defeated, that new life awaits your children and that creation is renewed in Christ. So we pray for our nations with hope. And we remember that your love is the true constant in our lives. So in this day and time, we pray as we are always told to pray, may your kingdom come in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of the eyes of the world are on Scotland this morning. And, uh, and we think that in our season of creation that we're in this September, our Celtic siblings up at Eco Congregation Scotland have encouraged us to begin our worship by taking time to look out on creation, to see God at work in the world around us. So before we come to our call to worship today, we're going to do just that. We're going to watch a video just two and a half minutes long that encourages us to take a breath, to look to God's creation and to give thanks. We see that video now.
in the beginning, God created all things and God saw that they were good. At our beginning, God created us, unique and irreplaceable, loved and wanted, known and treasured by God. In all our new beginnings, God creates something new. So we, we will see God in the freshness of this morning, in the laughter of friends, in the colours of creation, and with the community around us. So we pray, Creator God, open our eyes to see your presence, our souls to sense your presence, and our hearts to love your presence ever here in your creation, from the beginning into eternity. Amen. And we sing together our first hymn today, Morning Has Broken. We thank our worship uh, group, well, our musical worship group, to, uh, for uh, leading our hymns today. And we come to our notices. So uh, there's quite a few, but thank goodness that the newsletter is back. We are all relieved and pleased because it gives us some chance to know what we're doing. So we're very grateful to Marcia, who definitely deserves that cup of tea that she's been given uh, for all the work she does to get the newsletter together. So just a few things. Uh, th these are in the newsletter, but in case uh, it has gone errant or you haven't come to it yet. Um, this afternoon, some of us are going up to Sandvire uh, Uniting Church to as part of our church swap. We welcomed them a few weeks back. Some of us are going up there. I think people have signed up, but we're gathering at 2.30 by the old library in case, I'm getting the nod, uh, in case uh, people haven't. So, uh, well, if you have or haven't signed up, turn up then and I'm sure we can fit you in and we'll go up to their service at three. Uh, and for those who are, are interested then, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, uh, it's a chance to join in with their nurture group as well. Uh, each week they have a wonderful group, uh, like a Bible study where they come together and have discussions and, and look at um, some of today's uh, issues. So that's on Zoom as well. The link is in the newsletter, uh, which if you haven't got it, is on our website. Uh, and we're very welcome to join them. And for, for if you haven't got enough online activity, just a, a nod that next Sunday evening, 6 p.m., we have our Zoom storytelling communion. Uh, and this month's theme is stories of light and darkness. So poems, anecdotes, uh, stories that you might have of light and darkness. Other things going on this week, um, both sets, both churches, Castle Square and St David Uniting have uh, elders meetings, so do please uh, pray for the elders that they uh, may be uh, listening out for, for God's voice amongst us, uh, that we may uh, listen to each other intently to and uh, discern, discern the next few steps that each church have got to take. Uh, Wednesday at four o'clock, um, at Church House, we're having a time together to, to gather and to celebrate the, the part that Church House has played in uh, God's mission of love in Ponte and uh, to the world. 
So we're going to gather there at four. There'll be some memories, uh, time to share memories, time to share stories. And um, those who have had particular uh, work and resonance with, with Church House have been invited personally, but everyone is very much welcome to come. So if that's uh, interesting you, that's four o'clock uh, at Church House. There'll be a short time of uh, an informal service, but really a time of sharing memories, and then we'll have some refreshments. Um, I'm sure there are many other things, well, there, I know for a fact there are many other things in the newsletter, so do have a look. Um, there's news of things that people are celebrating and we want to celebrate with them, and there's news of people who might be struggling, and we uh, want to keep them in our prayers, so do have a look at that. Um, I know, for example, this, well, this is Bethan's first Zoom since her op, so we're very appreciative and we're glad that she can be with us and appreciative that she's uh, able to facilitate the Zoom. But it has been somewhat of a, of a full week in all sorts of ways. But seeing as this is the season of creation, I encourage us just to take a moment to think, where do we catch sight of God's beauty in the world this week? When do we hear a rumble of thunder or the sound of rustling leaves? When did we taste the earth's bounty with food and drink? What meals did we enjoy? What conversations, joys or heartaches have we shared with others? Let's be still for a moment as we review the week that we've spent connected with God and with all creation. Living God, we know that you speak to us through the beauty of creation, through the love of friends, in the meeting of strangers. So however we are participating today on Zoom, on YouTube, through the phone, speak to each of us, we pray. For we do come to you in a variety of ways and with a mixed bag of emotions. Some of us are sitting alone in our homes, others with friends or family. Some can see faces on the screen, others just the voices on the phone. Some may have had a fitful night's sleep. Others are fully rested. One or two might just be waking. No, we are physically apart. We are drawn and held together in your love. And so we gather as part of your wonderful creation. In our smallness, we catch sight of a world which is magnificent. And we glimpse into the breadth and length, the height and depth, into your divine spirit bursting into and out of all love. And for this, we give you our thanks and praise, for we know that you are with us here and now. And with our thanks, we bring our confession and we ask for forgiveness for there have been times this week that we've messed up. Times when we've made bad decisions or we've hurt others or damaged your world. So in a time, just a moment of quiet, we ask your forgiveness for ourselves and we ask for the healing of the world. And listen to what God says to us. I made the heavens and the earth. I call you to be responsible stewards. Come and work with me. I will always be with you. Amen. Well, this season of creation, we're doing all sorts of things in our services. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, stargazing in many different ways. We've got our harvest service to come. Um, I know last week we had storytellings at Castle Square. We've lots of things going on, but I think it's it's good to remember that Jesus engaged with creation in all sorts of ways. In fact, the, uh, John or 
Gospel of John tells us that all things were created through the Christ. And the very idea, the very reality of the incarnation itself, the birth and the life of Jesus, speaks of how God united with creation and the God who was with us. And then we can talk about Jesus' teaching, where he would often chat about uh, God or God's kingdom by referring to the natural world, often in parables, the sideways stories that would confuse and confound, engage and enthrall audiences, so that they'd have to actually think about what was said, something that many religious people don't always like to do. Well, today, like it or not, we are going to think about a couple of parables or stories that take place in the natural world. We're going to discuss one from Jesus in a, in a little while. But first, as we remember that God still speaks through people and stories today, I'm going to share one with you that I first heard in a woodland last month. And with both of these stories, I encourage us to think about what they might say to us, what they say to us about us or about God or about the world. So this first story then is an old folk tale, a version of which was told to me by the out of the box team at Greenbelt. And they like Jesus tell stories to create space to breathe, to trust, to listen, to feel, to wonder, to play and to love. They have a distinctive way of telling stories that I think we could engage with as a church in the future. But for now, here's one that they told at Greenbelt. And it went like this. One day, a girl went for a walk in the forest and she found a stick. So she played with the stick and she waved the stick around and she threw the stick into the air and then the stick got stuck in a tree. So the girl scratched her head and she decided she'd throw something up in the air to get the stick down. So she threw her comb up in the air. But the comb got stuck in the tree too. So she decided to throw a shoe to get the stick down. But the shoe got stuck in the tree too. So she threw an ironing board and she threw a balloon and she threw a giraffe up all into the tree, but they got stuck too. The ironing board, the balloon, the giraffe, they all got stuck in the tree. <sighs> and then the girl saw another stick on the ground. So she picked it up and she played with it and she skipped off on her way. I wonder what, if anything, you liked about the story. I wonder what, if anything, you didn't like about the story. And I wonder what the story, if anything, reminded you of. We're going to go into our groups for uh, five minutes while I recover shoes and giraffes and ironing boards. And I encourage you to, to discuss those questions. We're not going to feedback this bit, so don't worry. You can say what on earth was Phil talking about, or you can be completely honest. But just for five minutes, I encourage you to, to chat about those questions. What did you like about the story, if anything? What didn't you like about the story? And what, if anything, the story reminded you of? We'll be back, uh, yeah, just in about five or six minutes. Well, I, uh, we are back for the, uh, for the YouTubers. We did go away and have a chat. I don't know what was said, um, but we're not gonna do feedback on that. Um, we'll do that after the next one. This first one was just to get us wondering get us in that wondering state to hear stories and think, how do they relate to us? So we're going to continue that wonderment now as we come to one of Jesus' parables. Uh, and in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, we get a slew of parables of creation 
We hear stories of sowers and seeds, of weeds and yeast, uh, mustard seeds, trees, fish, and nestled in amongst them all is a two-verse tale about a pearl, which Sue is going to read for us today. Our reading is taken from Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Thanks, sir. Nice and succinct. So what's it all about? Hmm, what do we think? Sometimes it's said that Jesus is talking about himself here. That Jesus is the merchant who gives everything, including his life, for the sake of the kingdom. Could it be about that? Or maybe Jesus isn't the merchant, but the pearl. That we go about seeking fame, success, money or whatever that we go about seeking fine pearls but when we truly see jesus when we see that one pearl of great value that we could give up everything else for him could it be that or do you think it could be something entirely different i do believe that at different times the spirit can use these stories can use all of scriptures to share with us different things that we might need to hear for that moment and that time in our lives. So if today you need to be reminded that in Jesus, God did give up power and security to take on our flesh, to die our death and rise again, all to show how much is the wonder of God's love for us and all creation, then hear that. Or if today you need to hear the challenge that we need to give up our own comfort ego or refusal to change for the sake of god's kingdom then hear that others of us might hear those two interpretations of the parables as maybe a little obvious giving up all you have for the big pearl or or the, or the jesus being the merchant and he gives up everything he has for god's kingdom because in some ways they are a bit straightforward and that isn't the usual point of Jesus' parables. They're often meant to surprise us or confound expectations. And so if you're wondering if there are certain keys within the text, that's those short verses that we can think about, well, possibly. But let me share with you just three things before we discuss things as a group. Firstly, is there a reason why it's a merchant who is going looking and then sells all he has to own the pearl. Could it have been a, a king or a fisherman or a widow? Perhaps like shepherds or tax collectors, the, the profession of merchants came with certain connotations that we wouldn't be aware of. So that when Jesus first hearers heard that parable, perhaps they thought, ah, yeah, yeah, we know what merchants are like. And that could well be because back in, in some of the Jewish writing at the time, like the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiasticus, sorry, or Sirach, as it's also known, we, uh, we're told that a merchant can hardly keep from wrongdoing. And that was written about 100 or so years from before Jesus' time. So possibly Jesus' audiences would have sat up and taken notice when the main character in the story was a merchant. And they might not have had a positive view of him. What might that do to our understanding of the story, if anything? Secondly, pearls, the subject of uh, the merchant searching. He's searching for fine pearls, plural, and he finds one of great value to, and sells everything he has to own it. What was the deal with pearls in first century Palestine? Well, this is a little trickier to work out. On the one hand, pearls come from oysters, which weren't kosher. And according to Paul, at least, we hear that women are forbidden to wear pearls in church, which may be a bit of a surprise to the Twin Set and Pearls Brigade in some of our uh, communities. But maybe some of Jesus' first listeners would have had negative connotations then of pearls and would have been surprised by their mention in the parable. 
On the other hand, pearls were well known in Jesus' day as being very precious. And in another provocative statement, Jesus recommends not throwing pearls before swine, which some take to mean don't give what is precious or perhaps even holy to someone who doesn't understand its value, possibly. So maybe the pearls in the passage were meant to symbolize something precious. So precious or, or non-kosher and, and over-indulgent, two possible understandings of pearls. And finally, before we come to our group discussion then, this time with feedback, let's take a second to think of the merchant's actions. He's in search of those fine pearls, plural. For what? For whom? We don't really know, but maybe to buy and sell them, seeing as, as he's a merchant. So he's off to find some fine pearls. He finds just one of great value and sells everything he has to own it. Everything. Is that generally a wise move? Selling everything one has, one's home, one's clothing, one's provisions for ourselves and maybe even our family, all to purchase a pearl. The pearl can't offer companionship or nourishment or heating. So are we to see the merchant's actions as heroic or as fool foolhardy? Do they resonate with Jesus' words about losing one's life to gain it or with his warning about storing up treasures on earth? What are we going to take from all this? Unfortunately for you, that's not rhetorical, because we're going to go back into our groups again and have a think. And again, I want to stress, there is no right or wrong answer. Hearing what you've heard just from those first two verses, but also hearing some of those things that we've been thinking about, about the merchant, the pearl and, and his actions. What do we think the, the parable is about? So I'm going to ask you to think those two questions. Question one, what, if anything, does this story say to you about God or the world or yourself or God's kingdom? What does it say to you? And secondly, what, if anything, does this story have to say to us about how we live as followers of Jesus? So what is it saying about God or about us or about the world? And what, if anything, do you think it says about how we are to live as followers of Jesus? We're going to have just 30 seconds for us introverts to have a little think or a little Google, if you want to see what others have said. And then we're going to be put into our groups by Bethan. So just 30 seconds, just to have a think on our own. And then we'll be put in our groups. pause for the welcome back to those who are watching on uh, youtube and worshiping with us on youtube i hope you had a chance to have a think what that parable says to us today and this is where i i look to uh the zoom congregation to see if anyone would like to share what was um discussed in their group what that parable might might say to us about god or uh, god's kingdom about us and about how we might live as followers of jesus if you would like to share, just take yourself off mute and uh, go for it. I get you. I get you. Well, whilst you're... Oh, here we go. Am I on live? Brian, uh, yeah, you are on. We're, we're going to hear from Sue first. Put it on. Sue, then Brian, and then we'll come to Terry and Annette. Sue. Oh, yeah, well, I was nominated by the group to do this before I written anything down. So we're, it's, it's a very sketchy reflection. But one of the things that we talked about was perhaps it makes us think of what are the risks that we take in the way that we live and what it makes you perhaps question your values. Um, you know, we don't we, we talked about we don't know the reason why he bought it whether he bought it to sell on or whether he bought it to keep but it, either of those gives you a very different perspective of value yeah. uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, if he's holding it all for himself, then he had put everybody else at risk. But if he sells it, makes lots of money, then his family haven't actually lost. Um, and I said that I think the 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 first line is significant. It 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 is trying to tell us something about the kingdom. It comes at the end of a, or it, it's part of a long line of other parables about the kingdom. Um, so is it about God saying to us that the values of you know equality and justice, and for us to question the values that that kingdom is about? Mm. I hope I've summed up what people say. Oh, and um, you know, and and that our values can change over time, um, and things we hold dear can be different at different times. That was about it, really. I think. Thanks. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And what I love is that it, it raises all sorts of other questions. I think you could have like, you know, I think visually, like as a, a film or TV series, you could have five or six different stories that, that take this, the basic story. And yeah, who's it, who's it for? Does he sell it or keep it afterwards? Does he lose it? Does he get robbed? You know, what's he doing? Oh, they, they tell that a wider story about the merchant and what happens to the pearl. So I think those questions are really helpful. Thanks, Sue, for that feedback. Brian. Well, I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> but I will continue. Thank you. With, this is just thoughts. I changed the story slightly and I put it uh, to Viviane. What, what did she think if we sort of say the Catholic nuns and the Catholic priests who hide themselves away and what is the thought behind that? And she was just going to say something when we went bang. <laughs> I mean, no pressure, Vivian, but if you'd like to share that with us now, um, if you feel that you can, then feel free to take yourself off mute. But yeah, it does, again, um, while Vivian is deciding whether to do that or not, um, as Sue was saying, it brings up questions of, of our values of our, and of how we live. And yeah, it, some Christians who decide to that their, their calling is to, in, we see it as hiding away from the world, but they, you know, yeah. other, but some of them would see it as, as called to pray for the world, to hold the world in prayer and, and different understandings of, of our callings there. But seeing as Viviane hasn't taken herself off mute, I think we'll listen to, well, once the recording stopped, we'll, we might come back to her for her wisdom. But thanks for raising that, that question, Brian, and how that relates to different, different, different understands of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Terry and Annette, thoughts from you? Well, uh, I have to, I've got to be honest, I found it quite confusing and quite contradictory in, in some respect, I thought. And I just, we just couldn't, I couldn't work that out very well at all, to be honest. It, uh, I thought there has to be a reason why mm. that pearl within was so significant. Mm. And he wanted that himself. But whether he was looking for God in there somewhere, I, I'm not really sure. But I know uh, uh, Kath and uh, Kath saying, I think we're all of us on there found out a bit odd, a bit confusing. And I know uh, Kath was saying about it, it was, um, Kath, I can't remember what you said now. Can you switch yourself on and carry on? I'm loving how our explanations are just dropping other people in it. Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing. Um, what what did you what did I say that are you talking Let's, about when I mentioned John's book? Yeah, the gay yeah. disciple about the leper. Yeah, and what um, we were yeah. talking about the disciples um, um, giving up everything yeah. to follow Jesus. Yeah. But, they still lived their own lives. They were still, uh, they weren't all with Jesus all the time. And that um, the concept in the gay disciple gave a broader picture of what the life of, that, that they lived were. We were yeah. very confused about it. Um, mm. But it did slightly link to the girl in the first story where she gave up everything effectively and eventually picked up another stick and walked away which she realised that worldly things wouldn't be what she was looking at. She, the stick she had wasn't the one she really needed. She could do without it. But
but but that was I, I didn't say that then, but I mentioned it, it linked to the first story. Oh, Other than that, I, it confused me completely. Yeah, the, the, the I can imagine the and um, we said that the um merchant, if he was referring to himself, might have been a thrust at people who didn't really like him, that he was a merchant who was considered um not nice, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, gave up his life and sold everything, uh gave up his home with, with his father and died for us. Um mm. But other than that, it was so confusing. <laughs> Sorry. It's amazing how, isn't it? Just a, a two-verse a two story brings all these other questions and confusions. Well, that, mm -hmm. that's why it was only two verses, I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you know it it's, uh, lends people to various amounts of imagination and thinking. Mm. And, of course, a pearl is just symbolic. Yeah. And it's obviously like the golden fleece. Uh, trying to get Jason to look after the look for it and his and his band of argonauts, symbolic of Jesus yeah. and the disciples. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's some resonances there, isn't there? Definitely. There are, yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, the pearl is something like uh, the Mona Lisa that everybody wants to buy and has to keep because no one else has got one, yeah. and there's only one there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. something about the uniqueness of it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Annette. And um, Ray? I tend to think that we, we get confused and we try to interpret the story in all sorts of ways because we really can't face the real challenge of the story, which is that we won't experience the kingdom of heaven in full unless we give up everything. And none of us are prepared to do that. But that's, that's a challenge of it. That's a real challenge there, uh, I think, and a good way to end our, our, our sharing. Yeah, the challenge of actually maybe this was one of Jesus' more straightforward stories saying you know, we're encouraged to, to, to give up, to set all of the other things, that priorities we put in the way, including fi financial things and give everything we have to God's kingdom. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Well, I'm not going to add much more because... That would be ridiculous. Uh, although I did at once when when I when I thought what I should share and how I I earn my keep, um, uh, do a little bit of work every every occasionally. Um, it did remind me of um, of uh, one church leader I once heard who said, "Well, the whole point of these discussion type services, uh, I'll listen to everyone's ideas, then I'll correct the heresies." <laughs> um, fortunately, that person wasn't in the URC or even in the UK, but. Um, let me just share this to, to sum up before we come to our prayers. I, I do wonder uh, if, if, as Kath said, there is something of a link between those two stories today. For me, I wonder whether the story of the girl with the stick tells us how we can get obsessed with something or we can fool ourselves into thinking we're losing something. So we put all our energy and focus and time into trying to get it back, only to later realize that there are other sticks to be had. And that perhaps there is more abundance in God's kingdom than we're ever aware of. And I wonder whether the story of the, of the merchant with the pearls says something about what it is we're actually looking for. As, as Sue mentioned as well, like, well, about what's important and what's not, about what to keep and to divest, what's a risky investment and what's of true value. And perhaps individually and collectively, we want to reflect on how and what and where we put our energies invest our priorities into today? Are we giving all we have for God's kingdom or for other ones? And I wonder whether beyond all this talk of, of seeking and finding, losing and gaining, selling and buying, we might need to remember that it is God who finds us when we feel lost. God who loves us extravagantly, radically, recklessly. God who gives up everything to welcome us home whether with pearls in our pockets, sticks in our hands, or simply a longing in our hearts. Because time is getting away from us, I think we're going to go to our, our prayers now for ourselves, for others, and for the world. And I think with Simon moving, I think uh, Simon or Sue are going to be leading our prayers today. Let's just be still for a moment as we hand over to them. For our prayers.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and speak to us too. This morning we have reflected on the words of scripture and listen out for your voice. Help us to seek what is true, good and life-giving. Help us to find our home and our hope in you. We pray too for those of us who seek affirmation or love in unhealthy places. May they instead find worth in your love. We pray for those of us who suffer hurt, harm or sadness, that they might find healing. We pray for those of us afflicted by situation, state or habit, that they might find freedom. We pray for those of us oppressed by life, circumstances or others, that they might find release. We pray for those of us impoverished in terms of wealth, education or lack of compassion, that they might find increase. We pray for those of us who hate, harm and do ill, that they might find their humanity and that of others that they might repent and seek forgiveness. We pray for all, for there is no us and them, only us and we. So help us to be ever aware of our own inconnectedness with all people and all creation. And knowing that words can never convey all our hopes and fears and needs, we rest in a time of stillness in which we bring to you all our personal prayers. Thinking of those known to us who are in particular need today. Gracious God, we search and find and lose and buy and sell and worry. You love and love and love and love. Praise be to you. We thus bring these prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught us and his disciples saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So today we've heard two creation parables, two stories based in the natural world. And if you're leaving this time together with a sense of unease, that's okay. Sometimes that's good. And so I hope the questions and confusions about that parable inspire us this week to, to continue to think about it 
when you're driving up to Penrith later, perhaps ask those in the in the car, what, what, what on earth do you think it was about? When you uh, see Ray on Wednesday and wish him a very happy birthday, you might say, Ray, tell us more about the challenge of the parable. When you're doing the washing up, have a think more or, or have a little Google to see what other people have thought. That's what the parables are for, to get us to think, to discuss, to wonder and to pray. And so we come to our, our final hymn then for today, which uh, is a hymn in which we're reminded that God is the God of all creation. So we sing together, let all creation dance. time together is not almost at an end for those on zoom we will be gathering again uh, for a few minutes in our groups to have a chat uh, and and Stephen if you're around I think Bethan's going to put me in a group with you so we can have a chat about next week if you've got five minutes um, and then we'll gather together at the end and share in the grace but for now may the one who told stories that would change the world the one who delighted in creation the one who championed the poor fill us with his spirit that we may seek what is truly life-giving, challenge all that oppresses, and care for God's world today. And the blessing of God, creator, Christ, and comforter, be with us and all we know, now and forevermore. Amen.